This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Rob Ward. Rob, oh my god, what a career he's had. He has held senior management positions at PAX TV Network, Orion Pictures, ITC, Hal Roach Studios, Filmways, etc. And he has been the um, senior producer and creative consultant for Columbia TriStar Pictures, uh, Lionsgate, MGM, UA, Stars Encore Media, etc. And now he has a web series slash podcast called A Word on Westerns. I love that clever pun. Rob Word, A Word on Westerns. And he's interviewed so many legendary character actors from old Western TV shows and movies. And he's preserving oral history about the genre. And I'm going to have him on today. We're going to nerd about Westerns. And um, we're also going to... I want to talk to him a little bit about his uh, background working in the studio system and some of the TV shows that uh, he produced and co-wrote. You know, he's also a writer as well. I mean, he wears many hats in, in television, and it's going to be a great conversation. You know, he produced uh, Mr. T's TNT series, you know, after um, the A-Team, um, the William Tell revival series Crossbow, um, the Attack of the Killer Bee movies uh, special with Elvira, and lots of great stuff. It's going to be an interesting conversation today, and I love talking about Westerns. Also, happy birthday, the very hilarious and talented Wendy Liebman. I met her years ago at Rooster Tea Feathers in Sunnyvale, and she was a just a sweetheart. I've been trying to get her on the show since day one. Hopefully, it'll happen this year, finally. Also, rest in peace, Charles Deerkop, legendary actor, studio character actor. I tried for years to get him on here as well, but I never made the connection with him or his daughter. So, um, Rob actually did get to interview him, so we'll talk about it. So, yeah, here is my interview with Rob Word. Yeehaw! So, going back in time, do you remember the first Western movie you ever saw? Well, we used to go back in the olden days uh, as a family. Families would go to movies every week. We didn't have a TV uh, mm-hmm. when I was a little kid, so we went as a family. And I vividly remember seeing films like High Noon, yep. Shane, in the theaters. High Noon was 52, Shane was 53, so... I was about five years old, I guess, but uh, probably if I went into the deep researches of my mind or or was hypnotized to go back, I might uh, come up with another Western title for you, but I remember seeing a reissue of Wizard of Oz uh, on a big screen, too. Yeah, I I can't pinpoint the first Western I ever saw, but they've been a huge part of my life since day one. Like, my dad's a baby boomer, so he loves Westerns like crazy, you know? I mean, he watched all the John Wayne stuff, all the TV shows like Gunsmoke and Bonanza. In fact, he called me his little Haas Cartwright when I was a kid because I was a fat little kid. (laughs) (laughs) Well, come on, call call yourself ruggedly pudgy. That's what I always said about myself. (laughs) Exactly. How old is your father? How old is your dad? Uh, he, he's going to be 67 in a few days. Well, I'm about 10 years older than him, so uh, I'm a baby boomer as well. Yes, absolutely. Where are you from originally? Uh, Clearwater, Florida. So I grew up uh, in a small town. It was a very small town back then, and we knew everybody, and Dad was a flyer and a sailor. Uh, so I remember... Um, birthday parties. I'm one of four kids, and it was three at the time because my little brother came along ten years later. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But uh, I remember one birthday party at the airport, uh, all the little kids, and we were probably five or six, would go up uh, on a spin and a Piper Cub and and throw up. (laughs) (laughs) So those were great memories, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> and it was a wonderful place to grow up. So we grew up sailing and, and water skiing uh, as I got older. Uh, and, you know, certainly not out west, but you probably know this, that Florida was the, uh, at one time, the largest cattle raising state 
in the United States, larger than Texas. I believe it's number two right now. Of course, a lot of that is dairy cattle. But I, it's, uh, I actually didn't know that. That's that's up the new. Wow, I, I didn't know that it was the, it was a cattle racing state. That's that's amazing. So you grew up on a steady diet of westerns on TV and going to the theater and seeing the movies. You bet. And uh, on Saturday mornings when I was growing up too, we'd get dropped off at the theater. Uh, all the all the kids in the area uh, mm-hmm. at a, about nine o'clock, and we'd be picked up around one for lunch. But we'd see two movies, uh, a serial chapter, maybe five or six cartoons, and uh, it was a wild time. There would be a drawing for prizes and stuff. It it was a, a great way to grow up. So seeing those. Uh, with a group of kids, and wild, crazy kids, and wearing cat pistols, if it was a Western, mm-hmm. was just a normal way to grow up. Yeah. Oh, you said before that you didn't have a TV, so I'm sure you went to, like, friends' houses and watched on the TV. Well, nobody had TVs uh, in the 40s, and uh, I think 1952 or 53 is when uh, the FCC opened it up, so... Uh, licenses could be gotten and then the proliferation of tv channels spread at that time and so that's when we got a tv but i remember listening to the early radio shows prior to that and there was only one family uh, in the neighborhood with a tv and it, even when we got our tv there was nothing but static on tv came on at about three in the afternoon Right. One channel you could get, and then another channel might come on around five because they were. It, it was a, a new uh, experience, a, a new format for entertainment, and uh, it was a great time to be growing up because at that time, because there there weren't that many new programs, that right. the stations were filled with the early movies and most of the B westerns were the cheapest to license and so yeah. Tim McCoy and Hoot Gibson and Buck Jones, all of those uh, cowboys and Gene and Roy and Hoppy of course yeah. were all over the channels. It was a terrific, terrific time. Did you ever see a Lash LaRue movie on TV in those days? Because it seems like, you know, very few places have played him. No, we got Lash LaRue and it, it interesting. Uh, we didn't get the football since we got the last LaRue's and then when I moved out here there was a buddy of mine who was enamored with the Durango Kid movies mm-hmm. and we never they weren't licensed in the Tampa Bay area while I was growing up so I never saw those and then Charles Sterrett uh, who played the Durango Kid became a friend as, as did Jock Mahoney who doubled Oh yeah, in those films and made made Charlie look really, really good. Yeah, <laughs> they they were the same height, but Jocko had had coiled springs instead of legs, and was able to do all these wonderful magic stunts. Yeah, it was funny. I didn't even know who Lash Larue was until Harvey Keitel called Travolta that in Pulp Fiction. You know. <laughs> well, you're just a kid, though. Yeah. Well, from from what I remember up to that point, I knew who who Roy Roy Rogers was and Gene Autry and 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 Hoppy and all of them. You know the the, the B westerns. You know, and of course the Lone Ranger. I mean that horrible nineteen eighty one Lone Ranger movie was my first uh, reference point for the Lone Ranger. <laughs> oh no, you saw that before you saw any of Clayton's. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Well, how disappointing for you. <laughs> well, at the time, I actually thought it was a cool movie, but looking back, I see it now, I'm like, no, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Merle Haggard doing, like, a narrative song throughout the whole movie was one of the worst things about it. Yeah. It just, And then the second worst thing was that The Lone Ranger didn't even come into the movie until it was about halfway done. Yeah. It's the, the structure of the Superman movie. Mm-hmm. As like, Clark doesn't become actually Superman until way into the film. And they were looking for a, a, a monster hit for that. And, you know, they were getting nothing but bad publicity, having 
told Clayton Moore he was not allowed to wear the mask anymore. I remember we were doing the Golden Boot Awards at the time here. We started that in 1983 to honor people who made westerns. Mm -hmm. And Clay, uh, at first, wore his mask. Right. And he had to, had to stop. And Ray-Ban, I believe, was the company, made a pair of sunglasses that, that were in the shape of that black mask, and he wore those. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the fans helped support him and get that uh, ruling changed so that he was allowed to continue appearing as the Lone Ranger. And still today, he is the only Lone Ranger. Yes, exactly. You know, I, I watched the very first Western ever made recently, The Great Train Robbery from 1903. Have you seen it? Many times. I had an 8 millimeter print of it. And did you see it color tinted? Um, I don't know. I mean, it was black and white. Uh, originally, it was released, they would paint it uh, frame by frame uh, to give it color back then. Not all the scenes. Usually, for a night scene, they would dip it in the blue to give it that tone. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there were, like when the, the actor points his gun at the screen and shoots, uh, uh, it's like pink or yellow smoke that, that comes up. Pretty dramatic. Did you see uh, Dick Farnsworth in The Gray Fox, that movie shot up in Canada? Oh, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, but when there's that scene based on a, a real legend, I guess, was where... Dick had been in prison of the Gray Fox and comes out and goes into a Nickelodeon and the great train robbery is there and all of a sudden you hear a shot and a guy in, uh, <laughs> in, on these folding chairs shoots at the screen with his pistol when the guy pulls his gun. A great moment, a great moment in that film and Dick was fabulous in yeah. that too. Yeah. W wasn't Justice D. Barnes' iconic final shot part of a coffee commercial back in the day? I'm not sure. I don't know that. Because I, I have a vague recollection of seeing that in a commercial, like in the late 80s, early 90s. And when I saw it at the end of this, I was like, oh, yes, I remember that. I remember, I remember seeing that in like a commercial or something. Back when, uh, the, back when the, uh, the, um, the, the product companies, they used to like license old clips from like Charlie Chaplin and old like silent movies, and they would, they would show them in the commercials. That's what I remember it from. Do you have any uh, favorite John Wayne westerns? Well, naturally, the, the Searchers is a favorite because we were yeah. in Monument Valley when they were shooting it in 1955 and stayed uh, a couple of days to watch them shoot it. I was seven years old, and I have this photo of me with Duke, and he's kneeling down. He's got the cup of coffee. He's got the shaps on, the red bib shirt and suspenders, and... I'm right there in my Fess Parker Davy Crockett Walt Disney t-shirt with him, and it was a, a great memory. Everybody is jealous about that photo. Just, yeah, oh my God, that's uh, amazing. You must have been starstruck. Well, I knew who John Wayne was. I didn't at that time know who John Ford or Henry Brandon or, uh, or Ward Bond. Ward Bond mm -hmm. became... Uh, uh, the star of Wagon Train after that, that was 1957, I believe, when that started. So, but he had been uh, a USC pal of uh, John Wayne's when they were in college and they were football buddies. And um, in the summers, they worked at 20th Century Fox as grips. Wow. That is... But the Searchers, Searchers is, uh, you know, an iconic movie for so many, many reasons. Duke. I don't think was ever better. The film, I agree, with just not lethargy, but it was a success. But it's like, oh, it's another John Wayne, John Ford Western, and, and it's good. But now, of course, it is rated as one of the top ten movies of all time, and so many other movies have been influenced by that, from Star Wars to Taxi Driver, to, you know, just on and on and on. It's, uh, it's, each time you see it, it reveals something else in the movie. You'd, when I was a little kid, I saw it, and I just, like, the normal audience, I was, it's a good John Wayne film, and I was looking for the scenes that we had watched them film, 
mm-hmm. Monument Valley. And so maybe as a kid, as I guess it came out in 56, so I was nine at that time. It, it was uh, a little disappointing for me at, as a nine-year-old, but now it's taken on this glowing stature of one of the great films of all times. And uh, I'm, I'm just so lucky that we were there. Yeah, it's definitely my favorite Western, and I also love Red River, Rio Bravo, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, Three Godfathers, McClintock. Oh, God, he, he did a lot of great ones, you know. Even those early B ones, like the Sagebrush Trail is great, you know. Yeah, no, I love those uh, Lone Star B Westerns uh, that they made. Those, those are a lot of fun. He and Yakima Canut, that's when they developed the way to fight on screen up until that time. It was just more like a scuffle and it not not the choreographed work yeah. that Duke and, and Yak figured out. Yak had been a big star in the 20s in, in silent films. He was, a, he was a Western star along with Gibson and Art Accord and all these guys. But what happened, like with, with Tom Tyler too, who was a big star in the 20s, mm-hmm. The talkies, their voices didn't quite fit their character, and, and Yaks was kind of a high voice like this. And, <laughs> you know, he wasn't the leading man. <laughs> and so uh, he ended up becoming the father, uh, or I guess maybe the grandfather, of, of movie stunts and just a, a brilliant uh, choreographer, and he understood yeah. how to make movies. And a lot of people don't realize it, but he directed several films himself. Right. Uh, I can't believe the amount of movies John Wayne did year after year, you know, throughout his, his life and career. I don't know how he was able to, to balance it between, you know, having all these kids and, and, and being, you know, that big of a movie star, you know? Well, when he was, at, you know, when he had, like, Michael and, uh, and, and Patrick back in the 30s, yeah. uh, he was a B-Western star, so he was just a working actor. Right. Uh, and studying film at the time. He loved movies. He he fell into that and learned the craft of movie making and then the, those later films, uh, because of what he'd learned from Hawks and Ford, he would actually be directing them along with George Sherman and like, who's going to win that fight? John Wayne? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> directing, or George Sherman, who, uh, who directed him in some of the Three Mosquitoes films back in the 30s. Yeah. And, 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 and got credit for directing Big Jake, but Duke uh, was the guiding light, I guess is a nice way to, to put it. Mm-hmm. How about uh, favorite Clint Eastwood Westerns? I love the spaghetti westerns, but my favorite is The Outlaw Josie Wales. What a brilliant movie that is, and I, I don't know why it took so long for the critics and the public, really, yeah. to realize what a gifted filmmaker Clint is. Clint directed Outlaw Josie Wales. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, Phil Kaufman favorite, wrote it. What's your favorite Clint Eastwood film? What's your favorite? Let's see, I love uh, Fistful of Dollars, um, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I never really cared much for for a few dollars more, even though Lee Van Cleef is deviously evil in it. I, I, I just, I don't know, that one, it's like a, um, a, a weak second act in the trilogy, in my opinion. Um, but uh, High Plains Drifter is great, uh, Josie Wales is great, Unforgiven. I think a lot of people consider that to be his absolute best, and it's been his last one so far. Well, he he said there's not much more to say after that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a wonderful film, though. It really is, and I'm so proud that he won an Academy Award for Best Director. It got Best Picture, uh, and it also uh, got Morgan Freeman a uh, an Oscar as well. I think he got one in that. Maybe it was the Million Dollar Baby that Morgan got his from, but which is another fabulous movie. Clint is is the man of great films. Yeah, and you know, too, his his westerns were always psychological and bordered on supernatural. You know, they seem to come from a spiritual place. They're definitely not happy westerns. I mean, I think the closest he ever came to happy westerns was Paint Your Wagon and Bronco Billy. That's about it. 
Well, the Pager Wagon, I don't know if that was such a happy set, too, but uh, the uh, <laughs> Uncle Billy is a delightful movie. That's like a Frank Capra decided to make a Western. It's just charming. I like that movie a lot. Yeah, and even he has said that's that's like the best uh, thing he's ever uh, directed, you know, which is saying a lot considering the Academy Awards he's won since then. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but Bronco Billy is great. Yeah, Paint Your Wagon, I mean, it's a musical. That's why I was uh, I was, I was was saying that it's happy because it's a musical, but it is a, 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 it's got a dark undercurrent for sure, especially with whatever happened behind the scenes. I don't know. I, I haven't been able to find anybody from that movie to talk to, but my dad loves it. It's one of his favorites. I like it. And, you know, the, the look of it, the production uh, design is fabulous in that film. And, and Lee Marvin, I like Lee Marvin. When he first came out, everybody was deriding him. He had a hit song with Wandering Star. It mm-hmm. was a top 40 song <laughs> uh, with Lee singing. And I, I enjoy it. I do enjoy that film. Now, your background, too, though, you were first attracted to horror films, right? Well, no, comedy, well, yeah, comedy and horror were, like, my two favorites growing up, yes. But I, I love all genres. hmm Yeah, and, like, you know, I remember, you know, the first horror movie I ever saw was The Shining. First comedy I ever saw was Cannonball Run, you know, and it just developed from there. But um, like I said, you know, as far as Westerns go, I couldn't I couldn't tell you which one was the first one. It's just like it's always been there because my dad's such a Western lover, you know. Um, I mean, he loves the, the man who shot Liberty Valens. Mm-hmm. I like that, too. Yeah, that's Lee Marvin and Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne, and... That's John Ford, right? He directed it? Yeah, that is correct, and I'll tell you something funny about that. Woody Strode is in it, and I love Woody. And Woody was a friend once I moved out here, too, and he uh, is, I forget what his name is in that, but, yeah, he's bald. Woody Strode is bald, but what a wonderful, chiseled face he has. So yeah. Jimmy Stewart comes back to town, and he's an old man, and that's all in flashback, and the flashbacks, Woody's bald. Yeah. <laughs> when, he's, when he sees him again, he's got that stupid Uncle Remus cotton ring around his head <laughs> to make him look older. Yeah. <laughs> it just is kind of bad. That's bad. Yeah. Tell your dad, tell your dad I think that's bad in that movie. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I I love the Laurel and Hardy Western comedy Way Out West. Do you like that one? I love it. I love it. I was when I'm uh, one of the jobs I had out here. I was head of production at Hal Roach Studios, mm-hmm. and uh, it was at a time when you know the company had filed for bankruptcy, and I had been at Orion uh, uh, prior to that. But I got hired away to be head of production and marketing uh, at this vibrant young company that was taking over the assets of, of Hal Road Studios, and I have a knack for looking and finding things in libraries that studios own that they can repurpose and make new, and they hired me uh, to do that, and so I, as a kid, had corresponded with Stan Laurel. I told you already I had an 8 millimeter print of The Great Train Robbery, the 1903 film. Well, my major collection in 8mm, and these are all silent films, mm-hmm. were the Hal Roach Long and Hardy films, like Your Darn Tootin' and Big Business, uh, The Second Hundred Years. I loved them. And I, uh, I guess I was in junior high school or high school, I was corresponding with Stan Laurel, who lived out in Santa Monica. I'm still just this geek in, in Clearwater, Florida, you know, watching silent movies. Uh, and he, we, Corresponded, and it was just so exciting for me that later, I'm like 30 years later or whatever it was when I ended up out here, 20 years later uh, at Hell Road Studios, I had this photo mm-hmm. that I hung up in my office, and it was of Stan Laurel, and it says, Happy days, Rob. Your pal, Stan Laurel, and everybody thought I had faked that photo. And I go, no, no, it was really from Stan. And then to reevaluate those, uh, again, to re-experience the joy of those movies, which was a thrill because they held up so well. And we took the 35-millimeter 
from uh, the Library of Congress and restored the films uh, to release. And I put together this program called The Laurel and Hardy Show because the shows themselves, the, the Laurel and Hardy films, they're mostly short subjects. Right. And in the early early days of television, in the 50s when I was growing up, it, it wasn't the precision, the, the show has to run 22 minutes and 26 seconds because they're yeah. commercial slots uh, in a half hour block. And so the, the Nolan Hardy's features were chopped up back in the 50s and 60s, and that's how they were sold. Uh, but when color came in, they just kind of got taken off the market and they weren't running anymore. And then the Adam Costello movies that were all feature films, the Marx Brothers movies, feature films, Martin and Lewis, feature film comedies, those were easy to sell. And at that time, the independent stations were the big buyers of movies because they were competing against the primetime network shows with movies. But the Laurel and Hardys, you can't. The sales guys would say, how do I sell? This one is 20 minutes, this one's 18 minutes, this one's 40 minutes, what were they thinking? <laughs> and so I took all of this inventory, mm -hmm. loving it still, and created 26 90-minute programs by, like a puzzle, saying, well, I, I put three of these 20-minute ones in together, you know, how do I fill an hour and a half? And I came up with this idea for a Laurel and Hardy scrapbook that would run at the end of the show. Some of the episodes were way out west, your favorite, mm -hmm. uh, or one of their movies, uh, feature films, but the majority were these four reelers, three reelers, and two reelers combined uh, in different episodes to come up with a 90-minute program. Wow. And the, the Laurel and Hardy scrapbook uh, was many documentaries that I put at the end of the episode that could vary in length. So let's say I've got a, uh, a four-reeler and a two-reeler and the running time, I still need to fill six minutes. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, we'll do a, a mini documentary about Thelma Todd, their leading lady, or Jimmy Finlayson, the, yeah. the great... Uh, slow burn guy who was in <laughs> Mar Marvin, Marvin Hatley the, who did a lot of the music and so those were at the end of the episodes and then all of a sudden the sales guy said oh you mean we can sell all these shorts as 26 movies and I go exactly right and they did and it was a, it was a huge success which was very gratifying to get the boys back out there in front of people, a generation that had missed them and another generation that had never seen them. Yeah, I mean, I saw, you know, all, all the public domain stuff, you know, like the Flying Deuces and, and everything when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Of the Laurel and Hardy stuff. Also, uh, that one short, Be Big, that, that one cracks me up every time I see I it. I love that one. That's one of my favorites, too. You know, it's like the, uh, the Incredible Shrinking Man with all the big furniture and stuff. That's a funny one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of Bratz. Bratz is the one oh, yeah. where Stan and Ollie are, are the parents of, of a little Stan and a little Ollie. That's, that cracks me. They all crack me up. What am I saying? All of them, yeah. Have you have you ever seen Terror in a Texas Town? You know, earlier, you mean Terror of Tiny Town or Terror in a Texas Town? Terror in a Texas Town. The one with Sterling Hayden? Yes. Yes, uh, is that a Sam Fuller film or who directed that? I'd have to look that up, but um, I like that one a lot. I like that, too. I like it, you know, with the harpoon at the end. That's a good showdown. Uh, it was directed by Joseph H. Lewis. Okay, sure. Joseph Lewis. Yeah, he did uh, Gun Crazy. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Good film, film noir with John uh, Dahl. Mm-hmm. 1950. And Dalton Trumbo, he wrote uh, Terror in a Texas Town. Yep. Well, he was an auteur, and he directed quite a lot of the half-hour Rifleman episodes, too. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. How about uh, Glenn... You know who, who created the... Uh, uh, wrote the pilot that, that launched the Rifleman, don't you? 
Oh God, I used to. I used to. He wrote it. He didn't direct it, but it was Sam Peckinpah. Right, right, Peckinpah. That's right. Yeah, and then he ended up being uh, Arthur Gardner and Jules Levy, the guys running the company that was doing it, let Sam write and direct a Mm -hmm. few episodes. That's how he got launched, uh, uh, and he was using a lot of the same character actors that he would go back to as he was doing his features, R.G. Armstrong and Warren Oates and L.Q. Jones, just... uh, Boy, those those really hold up too. What do you think of the Rifleman? I watched the Rifleman when I was a kid with my dad. I thought it was it was it was an okay series. Um, well, I think if you revisited it, you would see how the parallels mm-hmm. of back then to today—it's a single character with all the parameters trying to raise a kid in adversity. He doesn't have much money, so he's got to take jobs uh, that he doesn't want to do every once in a while. But the relationship between Johnny Crawford, perhaps the finest child actor of all time on television, uh, and Chuck Connors, the relationship they had is just fabulous. And that they were able to create these many morality plays in 26 minutes week after week is uh, a, a, quite an accomplishment. But Peckinpah is the guy who, uh, who wrote the pilot. Wow. Yeah, I bet the guy who created the other Chuck Cotter's Western series, Branded, it was uh, Larry Cohen, who was a horror filmmaker. And yeah, Larry, Larry Cohen, he got fired. He, he got fired by the network because uh, uh, because of Chuck Connors because their political beliefs didn't match and he told Chuck Connors what the show was really about it was kind of a metaphorical uh, story about the blacklist in Hollywood from his own liberal point of view and Chuck Connors didn't like that so he had him fired and then uh, irony of irony the show like got canceled like a week or two later well, actually, no. It went in for another season. The first season was in black and white, and Larry got let go. But oh. Andy Finity came in. They brought him in to uh, continue the show, and it went to color, and did continue for another season. Oh, okay. Well, I wasn't too far off, but at least, you know, I knew the gist of the story. Uh, Glenn Ford Westerns. I mean, oh my God, Glenn Ford was a Canadian who looked like a rancher, and that's why he was so good at playing cowboys. Like, is there any uh, from from his canon that you like? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I, I love uh, so many of the ones with Glenn Ford. Sometimes you just feel like, I need a Glenn Ford movie. And there was something about him, but he was one of the finest horseback riders of them all. I mean, right up there with Joel McRae, uh, he, he just, he was a good hand. And uh, Three Violent Men, uh, have you seen, is that the name of that one, Three Violent Men? But, you know, the Cowboy, a, a, a terrific film. Yeah. Delmer Dave's, Delmer Dave's wrote and directed. That's a fabulous movie, too, with Jack Lemmon in, in a Western. But uh, wonderfully shot in color. But Delmer Dave, there's another director that doesn't get enough attention. He uh, was a writer director. He first began right. as a writer at Warner Brothers, but he wrote and directed Broken Arrow with Jimmy Stewart. Yep. It was a, a, a precedent setting film. He did The Last Wagon with Richard Whitmark and yep. Tommy Reddick and Nick Adams uh, and, uh, gosh, uh, Drumbeat. The, the film that launched uh, Charles Bronson with his new name. He had been Charles Businski before that, but all of those films were shot in and around Sedona, Arizona, with great rock formations that, that also became a character in his films. It's like John Ford had Monument Valley, mm-hmm. Bedeker had the Alabama Hills and Lone Pine, and Sedona was claimed by Delmer Daves, and those movies are just terrific. 310 to Yuma, he did too, Delmer Daves. I was just about to say that, 310 to Yuma too, yeah. And he did The Hanging Tree with Gary Cooper and George C. Scott. No, that was Anthony Mann. You sure? Was, he, he, did, he did do a movie with Gary Cooper and George C. Scott. I know that. And then that's it. I, I, I'm wrong then. Uh, I, I know whoever the director was got sick, and Carl Malden uh, took over directing for a couple weeks. Uh, it might have been Dumber Day, so I thought it was Anthony Mann. Could be it, it was the hanging. It was the hanging tree. It was it. It was um, Dumber Daves. It says here, and Carl Malden. Yes, he was in it. Yeah, 
uh, no, he ended up taking over for a while. Interesting, interesting. Um, I, I, I love, um, let's see, uh, Jimmy Stewart Westerns. You know, he did a bunch of them with Anthony Mann. Uh, was it the band from Laramie one of them? Yes, it was. That was shot in uh, Taos, uh, New Mexico, in, in the Pueblo. Mm-hmm. A great one. And, you know, Jimmy Stewart, he'd done Destry Rides again in 39, but not really done any Westerns until Winchester 73 with Anthony Mann. And it's funny how that came to be because it was at Universal and Jimmy Stewart at that time was freelancing after the war. Yeah. Uh, and uh, his agent was Lou Wasserman before Lou Wasserman uh, yeah. became the head of Universal Studios. But uh, Universal at that time wanted Jimmy Stewart to reprise his Broadway hit, Barbie, as a feature film. Yep. And they didn't have enough money to pay him what he wanted. And so Wasserman said, well, here, you know, we, there's this other little movie, this little black and white western that, uh, you know, let's throw that into this deal and, and instead of paying the fee that we think Jimmy deserves, uh, he'll take 50% of the profits of that film. And they said, well, sure, because that little black and white film, that's not going to do much. And, and we got him for the big film, Harvey, that's going to be our big uh, centerpiece for the year. Right. Russell. Well, Harvey came out, and it did okay. It made, made some money. But the monster hit was Winchester 73, and Jimmy Stewart scored big. And so all these other actors are going, wow, maybe that's what we should be doing. Uh, because the studio systems at that time in the early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, because they had been told they had to uh, divest themselves of ownership of the theaters, because they all the studios owned theaters. So if they were making... 50 or 60 movies a year, they knew those films were going to get played in the theaters that they owned. But the government said, you can't do that. That's a monopoly. So they had to sell off their theater chains. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the beginning of the end for the studio system. It kind of limped along in the early 50s, but uh, it, it changed. And Jimmy Stewart and Lou Wasserman were part of that big change that took place. Yeah, wow. Yeah, uh uh, what are your top three Desert Island Western movies? Well, The Wild Bunch, mm -hmm. uh, uh, along with uh, the, the Searchers. So, so let's see, I've got a Peckinpah, I've got a Ford. I think I'll take a Brando as my third choice. Would yeah. Be, guess, guess what it is? What? It's the only film he ever directed. He fired Stanley Kubrick from directing it and took over. And I love the movie. There's so much of it that's good. It's One-Eyed Jack. Oh, yes. Yes. I forgot that he that he took over for Kubrick. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine how that movie would have turned out if Kubrick had done the whole thing, you know? Well, thank goodness Brando took over. And, and the performances are just wonderful. Ben Johnson plays this mean, you know, egg-sucking killer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful film. And it had originally begun as a script written by, here it comes, Sam Peckinpah. He was going to do that film. Yeah, for me, it's The Searchers, The Gunfighter with Gregory Peck, Shane, mm -hmm. and maybe, honorable mention, The Long Riders. Oh, I love The Long Riders, too. I mean, there's so many of them, but you limited me to three, so what, you got a bonus choice yourself. That's not fair. Okay, number five for me, okay. <laughs> no, your bonus choice was The Long Riders. That was your fourth pick. Okay, what's your fourth pick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, uh, you know, should I pick a B-Western or something? I, maybe one of the Hoppy movies. I'm not even sure which one. Just to have a B-Western in that mix while I'm on my desert island. A Hoppy takes a, what's it called? Hoppy takes a writ uh, with Robert Bitchum's in it, and he's got that, he's got those sideburns. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was his first Hoppy movie. Yep. Hoppy serves. Hoppy serves a writ. And serves a writ. Yeah. And Mitchum. Mitchum did uh, seven Hoppy movies that year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and 
in fact, this this Friday night, uh, I've, I've relaunched. Uh, we we we're doing it during COVID, but we decided to start it up again. I introduce Western movies uh, on YouTube Friday night. Yeah. And uh, this Friday, March the first, it's the very first hop along Cassidy movie. So I do an introduction to it, and then I show a restored print of uh, of that film from 1930, wow. and, and that was a film that that changed everything because it was the first of the trio westerns where you had three cowboys from film to film to film and you know William Boyd was a little too old at the time to be doing the romance part so they had James Allison and then as the uh, the old crotchety guy who dies in this first film mm -hmm. George Hayes before he was Gabby before he was Gabby Hayes yep. he was Wendy and so anyway, I'm showing that if you tell your dad, it's six o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time on YouTube. I definitely will. I, 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 <laughs> I think he'll be delighted, you know, because he watches the Western Channel still to this day and everything. Um, well, I hope he watches my interviews because it's, they're done for people like your dad and me yeah. you know, that love the Western genre. So uh, if he's not watching them, he's missing out on a lot of fun. We tape these interviews with a live audience. And well, that, that, I'm glad they're alive. Yeah. Uh, but the, the response and the laughter uh, is so enticing and it, that it brings out the best in my guest. I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to tell him. Did you, did you know that I interviewed James Drury two weeks before he passed? I, I didn't. No, boy, what a nice man he was. He was, yeah. I could, I could tell, though, that, you know, he was pretty much over it by that point, you know. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an interesting interview. I didn't talk for, like, 15 minutes. I was just so enthralled with everything he was telling me, you know. And it was, it was a pretty interesting talk and stuff. Well, I'm going to have to listen. I'm going to dig that one up and listen to it. I, I did notice that you've uh, interviewed a few of the people that have been on my show, too. Barbara Luna, uh, think, yep. uh, Rosemary Forsythe, Beverly uh, Washburn. Washburn, yep. Uh, Clint, did you do Clint Howard, too? No, I haven't had Clint on. I've met him, though. Nice guy. Uh, he was wonderful. And Michael McGreevy, a terrific Mike, uh, yeah. actor. Have you, have you interviewed him? I've had Mike on. Uh, Phil Proctor, I noticed, was there. Um, yeah. Joanne Smith, and uh, she actually loved that, uh, that I'm going to be talking to you today. And Tony McClure, oh, God, she was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I know it. I know. I mean, it just uh, for me, hearing these stories of, of people making westerns is fascinating to me. I love the genre. Uh, there's just something about it. It is truly American, but the, the landscape, the wardrobe, the stories, you can tell any kind of story you want that in that time period and I yeah. think one of the reasons that we're seeing the proliferation right now on all of these different channels of the classic western programs from the 50s and 60s is that it satisfies a need that people have to get back to law and order you know where, mm -hmm. where the bad guys get punished that's, that's just, you know whatever happened to that and that because they are westerns they're already set in uh, uh, an older period that those programs hold up so much better than like the mod squad with the white plastic uh, cheerleader boots and stuff the yeah hairdos. I mean, the, the westerns uh, transcend the, uh, the, the, and the time period and make them ageless as we're watching them today it's a it's a step back and it's a satisfying feeling for people too. Mm -hmm. Yesterday we lost uh, the great Charles Durkop, and I know you interviewed him. What was he like? He was just a sweetheart. I had known him for, for years. Uh, he used to come to the Golden Boot Awards every year, as did anybody who ever made a Western. I got a nice picture of me with Bill Smith that you just mentioned, Joanne, mm -hmm. Bill, and Charlie Durkop at probably 1985 or 86 at our Golden Boot Awards. But I I reposted the interview with Charlie uh, yesterday. Uh, awesome. He sent me, uh, well, actually the writer from The Hollywood Reporter, because he had quoted from the interview I did with Charlie in his obituary, and he, he sent me a link just right as soon as he knew. And so I, uh, I went back in and, and pulled up 
uh, Charlie's interview and, and reposted it, and the response has been just so gratifying. Yeah. Uh, it oh. Just I, I'm I'm so fortunate to have been able to bring so many of these people uh, to, to light and uh, and give them the due. I mean, here here let me just this one that just came in just this morning. I just, I just sent it to a friend because I, I couldn't believe it. And, I, and uh, my, my son, who's associate producer on the show, it says, mm -hmm. uh, commented on the Charles Deercop, the headline on YouTube on A Word on Westerns, a sweet guy who played many bad hombres. And uh, a viewer called Rick Bowden, I don't know where he's from, says, mm -hmm. I just caught yet another reason to appreciate you and your team, so I gotta say it. It's only right. If I didn't, my dear old dad, who insisted I always acknowledge the good, would haunt me. Your forums provide a genuine blessing to the souls that need to share what's Aww. been privately on their hearts for bent years. We see their joy, we see their appreciation for listening and caring years as they remember and as they share. With us, their memories and their re -ex as they re-experience the old days. So... Without you and without your team and your work, souls wanting and needing to share good things wouldn't be able to share, and we wouldn't be able to show them how we care. They leave your stage clearly, as thankful and blessed as your audience. There you have it. Another oh. reason to keep going with encouragement. Thanks again for this interview. I mean, you know, gosh, my heart just swells when I get stuff like that. Ah, that is so beautiful to get that. Yeah, I mean... People have uh, I've interviewed have passed away, and like you know, I've gotten um, a, a reach out from the family thanking me because now they can hear the uh, the person's voice forever and stuff. It's just it's it's so gratifying, is, is what it is. Um, who who have been some of your favorite interviews you've done so far? I think my next one will be my favorite. Oh, it changes every day. <laughs> Well, I, you know, there's so many that are fun. Uh, you know, Ryan O'Neill, who we had an interesting relationship over the years, mm -hmm. uh, was a, a guest, and at his memorial service three weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, the video tribute starts off with a clip of me talking to Ryan, and then it's all this other stuff, and then suddenly in this montage, I'm I'm back, and Ryan and I are talking again, all lifted from my conversation from a word on westerns with ryan and he gosh he was great he kept me on my toes i don't know if you've seen that one or not but i haven't he, he he tells stuff that nobody ever heard before and, and that's one of the things that like like i think your show is you're you're probably getting people to reveal and remember things that that made them happy and and then they're sharing it and then in turn you share it with your audience too. That's sort of what I've been doing for 11 years now. Right. Uh, I was curious, when you were working for Orion Pictures, what years were you there? I was there from 1980 to uh, December of 85, uh, which is, uh, that's when they had hired me to go over to uh, uh, wherever I went, uh, Howard Studios. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my feeling is that, you know, you'll be able to, a, a, as an executive, you can double your salary one time. Mm -hmm. After that, you need to be at another company because uh, you can go through that same cycle again because they'll only double it once. So you, you, you so you got there when they were still with Warner Brothers and then they branched out on their own and you know they went from making movies no, like no. They, well, actually, oh, go ahead. I was uh, at a company called Filmways right of the, uh, that did mostly TV shows uh, you know Green Acres Beverly Hillbillies Mr. Ed all right. that stuff and Filmways was purchased by Orion after they left Warner Brothers. I think there was a, uh, Arthur Cram and Eric Pleskow had a problem with Warner Brothers somehow. And so they ended up, uh, and we became at Filmways Orion. So mm -hmm. the, the combined years that I was at Filmways and... Cagney and Lacey, I think, was the Orion show, wasn't it? Say that again? Cagney and Lacey. Yeah. Were yeah, it's, yes, it yeah. started as, uh, as, a, as Filmways, and then uh, again, it, it became Orion. Yeah. 
Uh, you did the uh, William Tell re revival series Crossbow on the Family Channel. Um, like, uh, wh like, uh, what was the whole genesis of that? Well, uh, what happened is uh, at Halbrook Studios, mm -hmm. uh, we we merged with a company called Robert Helmy. And mm -hmm. ended up, uh, as you probably know, uh, we changed our name to Quintex. We did uh, the miniseries Lonesome Dove with Bobby Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones. You know, Classic. The, the great television events of all time. Yeah. And uh, during that time, we were in production on a lot of other shows. I, at the time, I was wearing a bow tie. And so we did a show out of uh, Canada, uh, Toronto, with Mel Bonner, uh, Michael Hirsch, and... Uh, uh, Oh, uh, Patrick Bluebear called TNT with Mr. T. So I put Mr. T in a bow tie. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we did that for three years, and that that was a lot of fun. And during that same time, we launched uh, The Adventures of William Tell, which was uh, called Crossbow, but the pilot. I put together a group. I wanted to do, like, the wild bunch, and so initially... Lee Van Cleef said he might do this for me, but his wife Barbara said he can't take that much of a pay cut, Rob. But I did have uh, in it, uh, it was Soldiers of Fortune coming to help uh, William Tell rescue his son. But I had Robert Forster, one of my closest friends, Harry Carey Jr., yeah. uh, Guy, Guy Madison, who had been Wild Bill Hickok growing yep. up for me, uh, Johnny Crawford, yeah, uh, and Guy Rolf, uh, all in this uh, ninety-minute pilot, The Adventures of William Tell. But then we did the series. We shot it in the south of France, uh, in Avignon, and gosh, what a gorgeous, gorgeous place that was. Uh, and we were partnered with FR3, uh, a channel there in France, and uh, we did the half-hour series that became Crossbow. But so much fun going back and forth over there, too. Yeah, I noticed one of your regular directors was the infamous George Milhaka. George was great. I brought George over to uh, TNT also. He did a, uh, uh, a three-part episode, maybe it was four parts, on TNT that we turned into a movie called Straight Away, mm -hmm. with a connecting storyline, of course. But George and, and Christian Lubert, who was the uh, second uh, a A D on that, uh, because we had two crews going the whole time because we were trying to shoot as fast as we could. <laughs> and uh, uh, and but George was fabulous. I I really liked working with him and, and so did everybody else. And Christian I think has gone on to a terrific career too. Yeah, but Mahaka, you know, he directed by Bloody Valentine. That's that got a huge cult success. Oh, and that's what he's still known for. He's not known for TNT or Crossbow. No. <laughs> and I understand why. I mean, the, the horror fans are really, uh, like you said, it, it's a cult film. And they're it's just like Westerns. But the, the difference is the Western cult movies and fans, our demographic is uh, quite a bit different than yeah. that of the horror movie fans. How, how did you come to produce and co-write Attack of the Killer Bee movies? Uh, well, it's one of those where I'm looking in uh, the libraries. I had uh, worked at, uh, when I was uh, at Hal Roach, we had uh, a, a side business that became very successful uh, out of Toronto where the, uh, the chairman had lived. I got the rights to a new process called colorization and to colorize uh, black and white films, as you know. Mm -hmm. At the time, the, uh, the palette, the color palette, it was all analog, and so you didn't have that many colors to choose from. These days, the colorization, it it's, looks fabulous. And by the time I did uh, the, the bad sci-fi Attack of the Killer Bee movies, the process had gotten much better. I was hired as a president of uh, uh, featureizations at a company called Color Systems Technology, CST, yeah. and came up with different projects. And one of them was to take these old black and white horror movies that uh, had three or four cool scenes in them and the rest was padding because they were made for the drive-ins and, you know, to give the teenagers a chance to make out and stuff at the drive-ins. 
that uh, mm-hmm. so I I began my career out of college as a cinematographer editor for ABC News, and so I thought I can take these uh, pretty dull, boring movies that have some interest for me because I'm a film buff, and I can make them 22 minutes and make them fly, make them fun. And so I took really bad movies and <laughs> we did 13, 13 episodes that I called Bad Sci-Fi. Well, NBC had seen the success we had had with a movie I wrote and produced called Wyatt Earp Return to Tombstone, where I had the rights to the original Wyatt Earp TV series with Hugh O'Brien mm-hmm. and wrote a new story and used the original series as flashbacks, but colorized. Right. We shot our new stuff in color with little Bo Hopkins and uh, Marty Cove and Bruce Boxleitner and Paul right. Peter, who had been in the original series and, and uh, shot it in Tombstone, actually the first White Earth movie ever to film it, and called it White Earth Return to Tombstone. And that had been number one on CBS. It was a network movie. I had Johnny Cash sing the theme song that I wove through the film. And so... Uh, who had, uh, I guess, NBC called up and said, can you do something like that for us? And and I thought, well, we'll take these John Waynes that are the public domain uh, 13B movies that he did that I loved so much that we talked about earlier with uh, Yakima Canet and see if we can do something similar with them and sell it as a Saturday morning kids show so that they can see something other than just the cartoons. Because when I was growing up, we got to see the Roy Rogers show and Fury and My Friend Flicka and Sky King and all these wonderful live action shows. So uh, I, we went in and pitched them that. And they said, uh, well, can you do anything uh, with, with like horror movies? And yeah. I said, here's a list. And I said, I have 13 half hours of this I can uh, do, too. So they cherry-picked the four that they wanted, and we shot new wraparounds with Elvira Mm -hmm. uh, for primetime on NBC, and they called it uh, Attack of the Killer Bee Movies uh, as a two-hour special. Mm -hmm. And they ran it. Couldn't believe they ran it in (laughs) primetime. Yeah. (laughs) What was it like working with her? Oh, she's great. She's, uh, you know, a real pro. She's fantastic, Elvira, yeah. I, I, I met her recently. It wasn't uh, a good experience, but who wants to be negative, <laughs> you know, in, in this lively conversation? That's right. That's right. Uh, have, have, have you ever met Joe Bob Briggs? Uh, I have not met him, no. Very nice man. Very nice man. <laughs> You know, he 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 loves the uh, the drive-in movies. I've never heard him talk about westerns. I would love to hear him talk about westerns because obviously he's a cowboy. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, he's from Texas, all right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Do you have anything uh, upcoming you'd like to mention? Well, I mentioned our new series, uh, Friday Nights, uh, uh, yeah. Western every Friday night on on YouTube, and every Sunday morning we have a new interview. Uh, talking about westerns on a word on westerns and so our friday night show is called words way back because we go way back and show classic westerns and on sunday it's uh, we're continuing with a word on westerns the interview show and so there's like 500 episodes uh, for people to to go to the site and and check out because a lot of the people like i mentioned ryan o'neill who just passed and early dear cop but uh when you know, L.Q. Jones would come to every taping and, and Bo Hopkins, and when they passed weeks apart, just one right after the other, the, the, the two last big stars uh, from the States of the Wild Bunch, and, you know, both dear friends. Uh, that's mm-hmm. what happens. The living out here, you know, you meet these people, and, and they... They're friends, and that's how I started to do this show. I said, well, I'm having lunch once a month with all these guys, and they're dying, but they're telling great stories, and nobody is documenting this. So I went to the Autry Museum and said, uh, I've got a bunch of cowboy friends, and I'm wondering if we could have lunch here at your cafe. And they said, well, yeah, during the week, there's not many people here, school kids. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and then I said, and after lunch, I might set up a camera and shoot some interviews. Is that okay? And they said, sure. Well, it exploded. It became what it is. Now, they, we didn't last long in the restaurant because the crowd overflowed and they couldn't get in to see the interviews. And they said, would you like to do these in the theater? And so that's when we, 10 years ago, we moved into the Wells Fargo Theater, which has been just delightful. I shoot these interviews with four cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, I spend probably 20 or 30 hours a week editing because I put all these clips and stills in. And it's just fun. A lot of people play golf. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I edit. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Are you going to write a book? I don't have time. I, and once I stop doing this, uh, I would have time. I mean, literally, yeah. I mean, overall, it's, it's 40 or 50 hours a week, and I, I do log my hours in so that I know what I'm spending my time on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's all time, It's all consuming. Like, I'm going out of town to go on a, 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 a five-day horseback ride in Arizona, but to do that, I have to have at least two episodes done so instead of a 40 hour week i'm looking at a 120 hour week right and just where's the time I, during COVID, everybody was going oh i'm so bored i'm just so tired of watching netflix and reading and i'm going gosh wouldn't it be nice to just read yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and all i'm doing is research i'm not complaining i love it and uh probably what i'd be doing anyway so Fantastic. Uh, you. You, lo- you love what you're doing, too, and you're obviously good at it because you've let me ramble on and on and on. <laughs> I hope I've not been too dull for your uh, listeners. Not at all. You've been fantastic, Rob, and I thank you so much for not only coming on today but preserving oral history of Westerns and uh, just continue doing it and be safe out there. I appreciate it, and tell your dad hello, Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell him to watch uh, your series and check out your channel. Oh, he'll love it. And tell him to leave me a comment, too. Okay. <laughs> have a All great right. have a great day. Be safe. You, too, and uh, continued success to you, too. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Rob Word. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, my God. Go check out his channel, A Word on Westerns, and check out his interview series. He is fabulous. I enjoy it. Every time he posts something new, I enjoy it. and You will as well, and I will tell my dad as well, and I'll tell him hi. (laughs) Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Fire, dudes. Yeehaw!